but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thess.2, 7-12. Verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Verse 4, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which had not the seal of God in their foreheads. Verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. Verse 6, And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. As Satan continues to smoke the churches with his bogus presence of God, his demonic spirits are working within that religious atmosphere. It is by these means that he is able to cause such a great deception among Christians. As God sends forth his heavenly angels to minister to his earthly servants, Satan also sends forth his hellish demons to minister to his own. Satan's ministers are wolves in sheep's clothing in every way they look like real spiritual Christians with good characters, humble, meek and caring. When they open their mouths to confess their faith, only then could a Bible believer know who they are. These demonic angels were depicted as locusts in John's vision to show the frenzy and destructive nature of their ministries. We know that pests, such as caterpillars, palmer worms, canker worms and locusts eat the greens of the fields. But the locusts do not just eat the greens, they are strippers of life of the greens. And they do it bit by bit. When they gather in large groups, they tend to swarm from place to place. Farmers are completely helpless if a swarm of locusts comes upon their field of growing crops. The growing crops would just die at the mouths of the locusts. Within minutes, the field would be in ruins. That is exactly what these locusts, demons, from the smoke of the bottomless pit are doing. Taking advantage of human weakness, they prey on the minds of the intellectual, theological, seminary-trained ministers, who hold a string of degrees, and also those foolish self-styled ministers of God, who go about parroting the words and sayings of true men of God without any revelation of what they meant. These demons would agitate the ego of the puffed-up ministers and exert their influence over them. These men, in turn, would gradually sap the strength and life of the worshippers who congregate with them to listen to their teachings. Is this not the same situation for which our Lord Jesus had reproved the scribes and the Pharisees? Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matt.15, 7-9 Woe unto you, lawyers, experts in the law of Moses, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. LK, 1152. Oh, my, it happened even in Jesus' time. And since the beginning of the church age many false apostles have appeared with their false teachings, Reverend 2-2. That same spirit of hypocrisy is also right here in our time. Believe this, my friend. If you do not come out of the organized religious system of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth now, you will be destroyed soon. EPH.5 5 to 17, Matt.22, 11 to 14. If you have enough sheep sense in your head, come out of her immediately and stop those nonsensical beliefs of saying what your denomination says, what your church says, what your pastor says, what your priest says, what your prophet says, or what your apostle says. They are not the absolute authority, the word of God is. Oh yes, all their words may sound good and authoritative, but the things of God are spiritually discerned. 1 Cor.2, 14. Their words cause death for they do not speak the truth. But the spirit of the Logos gives life. Come right into the light, sun, and life, air of the living spirit of Christ, the word of God, and breathe the life of the spirit and receive his eternal life. Pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. EPH 117. God is alive. Amen. Normally, locusts do not have power to torment any living creature. However, these hellish locusts were given the power like that of the scorpions whose poisonous stings could cause excruciating pain in the body of man as well as numbness, dullness, confusion and delusion in his mind. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months, Reverend 9:10. Demons love to play follow the leader game. When Satan fell from his heavenly estate, he made a third of the angelic beings to follow his tail. He is like the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail, Esau.9:15. Now, these fallen angels are as perverted as Satan himself. They, too, are causing Christians to hold to their tails as they work through so-called servants of God. These Christians are so numbed by the stings of the locust spirits that their spiritual sense, if there are any left at all, have become confused, dull and delirious to recognize the truth of the word of God. They would simply ignore their bondage to the locust spirits and their torment in the hellish smoky system even when God's truth is made known to them. In their delusion they are made to believe a lie. 
Yes, they are like the religious Pharisees, Sadducees and scribes who, under the influence of the fallen spirits, were holding to, and teaching for doctrines, the traditions of men. How people can sometimes become so stupid and foolish. Without the Holy Spirit, they would just simply remain religious. When hell is totally opened up in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, all those locust spirits, which are manifesting themselves now, will really run wild on earth. That would be the first woe, like the beast which carries the great whore, and later turns upon her. Rev.17-18, the locust spirits will readily and eventually torment the souls of all who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. These people would be so tormented and hurt that they would want to die. Yet, no matter what they would do to seek death, death will flee from them. In other words, they could not even find the courage to commit suicide. It would not be there in their spirit. Hence, their souls would have to bear the torment of the scorpion stings of the hellish locust spirits for five months. Yes, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, Mad.22, 11-14. Notice that it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. This very statement verifies that the locusts in this vision are not natural locusts. Natural locusts eat and devour the green of the earth. Read Exodus chapter 10 verses 13 to 15. However, some may argue that these locusts with stings of scorpions are literal and that they are created by God to torment those who reject his gospel. Friends, the Bible tells me that after God had finished all his creations he ceased from his works, General 2, 1 to 2, Heb, 4 10. These creatures which John saw were demons engaged in demonic activities upon the earth. What then does the green here, such as grass and tree, refer to? The elect, of course. These are the green that the locust spirits cannot hurt nor touch. They are the green of the earth for they are planted by the rivers of the living waters of God's word and spirit, PSM. 1 to 3, 23 to 2, 52 to 8, Hose, 14 to 8. They have the Holy Spirit of life. Amen. Satan's angels cannot hurt those who have the seal of God in their foreheads. And in that first five months of the beginning of the great tribulation, when the first woe is brought upon the earth, the locust spirits would also not be able to hurt those who are sealed under the ministries of the two witnesses and the foolish virgins. They would only be able to hurt those men and women who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. Verse 7, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. Verse 8, And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Verse 9, And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Verse 10, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. There were no such locusts on earth and never will there be any. Knowing this to be so, some prophetic teachers point the descriptions in the passage to some sort of literal war machines such as tanks and aircraft. This interpretation is supported by Revelation chapter 9 verses 17 to 19. Those are indeed military weapons of wars. The shapes of the locusts from the bottomless pit as seen in the vision symbolize several things. Firstly, they were likened unto horses prepared unto battle which conveys the idea that the demons were sent forth to battle another principality that of Christ Jesus to destroy it, cf. Rev.19, 11-16. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle depicts the swiftness of their attack in the battle. They are spiritual war machines, so to speak. Remember that these satanic spirits work in both realms. The scriptures clearly tell us that there will always be spiritual warfares in heaven and on earth, Rev. 12-7, Matt.11. 12, as long as God has not brought in the last elect into his kingdom. So, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, EPH.6, 11-18. Next, on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men depicts the false glory placed upon intellectual men whom the locust spirits used to build Satan's Church of God. Just look at Christianity today, and you will see the big beautiful buildings, big programs, and big everything. Then look at its leaders, and you will never fail to see the holier-than-thou image they have created for themselves. They are graduates of some prestigious seminaries, crowned with square hats and conferred strings of golden degrees which give them the rights to use various titles to their names. They are angels of light, aren't they? 
Look at their faces. Are they not faces of intellectual men, very much like the Pharisees, Sadducees and scribes? They are nothing but hypocrites and wolves in sheep's clothing. Do they not have certain traditions in their religious stance that you just cannot fail to notice them as Reverend, Right Reverend, Very Reverend, Cardinal, Monsignor, Archbishop, Doctor, or many other such like fanciful titles, which are conferred upon them each time they completed some seminarial studies, Matt.23, 1-7. Even Isaiah spoke of them in chapter 65 and verse 5, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. But these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day saith the Lord. Now, was Christ known by such a stance? Not at all, he was just too ordinary to attract any notice, Esau.53, 2-3. He did not come from any recognized ecclesiastical order of the day. He could only be balls above, so they thought of him, and called him so. The same is true of Christ's disciples and the prophets of old. If they were here in our days, without th, d, 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 and other letters to their names, do you think that they will be accepted by the big mainstream religious Christian orders? Certainly not, oh my, how time has changed people and religions. In the first half of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul expounds the subject of headship in its glory. In verse 15, he says that if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. The long hair on the woman's head indicates the headship over her. It shows her submission to the authority over her and which covers her. Now, we know that the woman is a type of the church that has been espoused to Christ, 2 Cor.11, 2, and Christ, the man, is the head of the church, the woman. Her glory is, therefore, Christ, the word of God. The church is crowned with the glory of the word. Hence, if shame is heaped upon a believing woman for dishonoring her headship by cutting off, or trimming, her hair which is her covering, what consequences will the church face if she cuts off, or removes, the glorious covering of God's holy word, which has been given to her, and substitutes it with some man-made creeds and dogmas? Undoubtedly she will face dire consequences. Obviously Satan had put to use whatever knowledge he had acquired. He simply made his locust spirits appear as if they had hair as the hair of women to impersonate the crowning glory of the word of God. My, my, make believers, false teachers, false Christianity all very religious looking just like the real things. Yes, they are very attractive and seductive, but their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Oh, what powerful teeth they had, the better to kill, of course. Like roaring lions, they walk about, seeking whom they may devour, cf. 1 Pet.5, 8, Ezek, 22, 25, Joel chapter 1 verses 6, 7. That's right, for five months they will torment those without the seal of God in their foreheads before they seize their souls in death. In order to withstand the attack of the enemy, the Bible believers are told by the Apostle Paul to put on the whole armor of God, EPH.6, 10-18. The breastplate of righteousness, faith and love, 1 Thess.5, 8, is a part of the whole armor. It protects that part of the spiritual body which holds our faith, love and righteousness in the Lord's promised word. Satan's demons also had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron but they were breastplates of might and standing in a big system. Look at Goliath of the Philistines who came to challenge the army of Israel to a duel. He was a big man and he had trust in the authority of the leaders of the big nation of the Philistines, and in the iron suit of armor that was specially designed and made for him. Big is might, iron is strength, together they symbolize indestructibility, especially with his breastplate of iron covering his chest to protect his heart, Goliath believed that no one could kill him. Ha, huh, but all that faith was only inside his skull the place of human intellect. Wasn't the skull the place where they crucified Jesus Christ, JHN.19, 17-18? Weren't there many seminary-educated men who had crucified the word of God in their intellectual skulls throughout the past history of the church? David had full knowledge of that when he confronted Goliath in the name of the Lord. And with just one stone of faith properly placed, he put an end to that intellectual, egoistic and carnal adversary of God. Amen. Abed and Apollyon. Verse 11, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. This verse needs no interpretation. It is obvious that every army has a leader or a king. The king of the locust spirits is none other than Satan, the adversary of God. His name in the Hebrew tongue, Abaddon, tells us that he is a destroying angel, and in the Greek tongue, he is Apollyon, a destroyer who destroys utterly. Yes, Satan, a liar and a murderer from the beginning, seeks only to steal and to kill, J.H.N. 1010, 844, Reverend 11-7. Verse 12, one woe is past, and, behold, there come two woes more hereafter. The second and third woes actually follow right after the first woe but are only described in Revelation chapter 11 verses 7 to 14 and 12 to 7 17 respectively. In brief, the first woe is when hell breaks loose completely with demons tormenting mankind. The second woe is when Satan kills the two witnesses, silencing the word of God. And the third woe is when Satan is incarnate in the man of sin. Remember, all these three woes happen right in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel. 
It will be the beginning of the Great Tribulation, a time when the dark forces of hell break loose upon the world. The Sixth Trumpet Verse 13 And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Verse 14 Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Verse 15 And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Recall the vision that John saw of four angels standing on the four corners of the earth in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. They are not chained to that area but rather they are held there in the river Euphrates by the word of the Lord to hold back the four winds of the world so that the world would not enter into Armageddon until the 144,000 Jewish servants of the Lord are sealed. The river Euphrates symbolizes the chastisement of Israel and the shield or rampart that stands between nations. It is some time after the middle of the 70th week of Daniel that this sixth trumpet is blown, which means that the 144,000 Jewish servants of the Lord would have been sealed by the Lord and the two witnesses would have been killed by the Antichrist, which is the second woe. These four angels are told to let loose the four forces political, religious, economic and military so that they would bring about Armageddon, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, according to the time that God had appointed. The demonic spirits that are let loose upon the world to torment mankind would now begin to stir up the different nations, especially the powerful communistic nations of the Far East and the beast system of the United European Nations which is written by the Pope. Later on in Revelation chapter 16 John saw another vision pertaining to this tempest that would bring an inevitable war that will end all wars before the Lord Jesus comes to reign over the earth. The demons will have their heyday as the four angels let loose the four forces at the sounding of the sixth trumpet. They will stir up the spirit of mankind to kill and destroy themselves by bringing the nations to Armageddon. War has always been fought since the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden. It has always been fought on religious ground. It is one of Satan's ploys to destroy mankind. John's description of these happenings may appear similar to those at the sounding of the fifth trumpet. But a closer examination of the sixth trumpet will reveal that the things he saw, though demonic in appearance, are actually military. Remember, this will be the last move of Satan and his horde before they are seized by Christ at his glorious appearing and bound for a thousand years. Verse 16, And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. The armies of soldiers that will be geared up for the battle of Armageddon are two hundred million. That is the number that John heard in his vision. Centuries ago, the number of fighting men of this magnitude was unimaginable but with today's world population of six billions, the nation of China alone has that number of soldiers. Verse 17, And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Verse 18, By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Verse 19, For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Deployed with the armies of soldiers, specially clothed and protected, will be horses' war machines such as tanks, artilleries, amphibians, missiles, etc. These war machines look like lions as they roar and spit fire, sulfur and smoke out of their mouths. Swinging turrets on some war machines such as aircraft and tanks are powerful tails. Guided missiles are like serpents gliding, snaking, to their victims. They pack powerful warheads which hurt to kill. These demonic machines will hurt and kill a third of mankind. Verse 20 and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Verse 21, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Remember that God's Spirit will no longer draw men to himself in that day of the Great Tribulation. The gospel of grace and mercy would almost be finished with the Jews as Christ gets ready to come and fight the nations. There is nothing left for the wicked. Even after the calamity of Armageddon men who are filthy will continue in their filthiness. Those who are unrighteous will continue in their unrighteousness. Those who are unholy will continue in their unholiness. And similarly the rest of the people will live according to their own sinful lifestyle stealing, fornicating, killing, practice sorceries, idol worshipping, etc. Man will even eat man in that day. They will not repent because they cannot repent. They will continue in their demonic delusion. The world will be in a chaotic condition. May God help us to be watchful and prayerful that we may not be caught in Satan's web of deception.